to talk about a little bit more about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis because when it comes to PTSD, that particular structure that I started talking about on the last video in the fight or flight response turns out to be really important in understanding what dysregulates when people develop PTSD, especially chronic forms of PTSD that I was mentioning before, the intractable, uh, refractory, chronic, complex form that seems to be unremitting, or if it is remitting only for a short time and then symptoms continue. Um, let's talk more about this. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how propranolol works. So you can think more about some of those ethical issues and whether you think it should be done or not. Um, remember, that the HPA axis is a critical physiological component of fight or flight. Because when your amygdala decides there's a threat, remember, it begins to signal the hypothalamus. If the prefrontal cortex, particularly those two structures that I mentioned, the anterior cingulate gyrus, for example, and the medial, right, the medial prefrontal cortex, if those structures send back information to the amygdala saying, yes, this is definitely a threat, if they interpret it that way, that pushes the hypothalamus into full-blown fight or flight mode. And that hypothalamic structure in your brain then signals your pituitary gland at the base of your brain. And that pituitary gland signals your adrenals above your kidneys. And the net effect of all of that is one, the brain is starting to activate the fear structures to get you ready and poised to respond. The hypothalamus, pituitary, and the adrenal glands, the HPA components, are releasing large amounts of stress hormones like cortisol and neurotransmitters, like epinephrine or adrenaline and norepinephrine or noradrenaline, because they're getting your brain and body ready for fight or flight. Like, okay, this is a threat. Let's pull out all of our resources and we either have to fight this thing and beat it or we've got to run like hell and escape it. Now, here's the thing. Under normal conditions, remember this system has evolved for a reason. Under normal conditions, that system self-regulates. Feedback to the hypothalamus dampens the stress response and lowers the reactivity of the fear response network in the brain and stops the release of those neurotransmitters and hormones once the threat is no longer present, once threat is right averted. What studies indicate is that people with post-traumatic stress disorder have a dysregulation of the HPA axis. What that does then is it reduces the fear response network in the brain. It reduces the ability of those brain structures to return to its homeostatic place. Homeostasis, remember, is that place where all bodily structures are at optimal levels of functioning in cohort, um, in combination with each other. So when the hypothalamus signals the pituitary and the pituitary signals the adrenals, if there's an actual threat, once your brain gets the message that the threat is no longer present, then it stops the release of those chemicals and that part of the brain stops firing so much and returns to its normal level of functioning. With PTSD, that doesn't happen. So instead, large excess amounts of noradrenaline or norepinephrine flood the brain. And that projects to the amygdala. So the amygdala, the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, and the hypothalamus, those fear structures that communicate Excessive amounts of norepinephrine are projecting and causing them to continue to fire and keep that fear response going and keep signaling the HPA axis to keep activating the fight or flight response and flooding, right, the brain and body with these neurotransmitters and hormones. What the net effect of that is, is that people with PTSD encode much more strongly the trauma memory. So one of the things that studies suggest happens is the flooding of norepinephrine into the brain consolidates the fear memory. Another way of saying this is it creates a hyper-encoded or hyper-memory. 
And that is what underlies, for example, hypervigilance symptoms. Why are people so poised for looking for threats in the environment? Why do they, why do they react so strongly to any cue? Because they've hyper encoded the fear memory, the trauma memory in such a way that it's ever present and it's always being activated in their memory system and brought to consciousness. So if you look on slide 14, what goes wrong in PTSD? This is what the nature of the deficits appear to be. The initial trauma memory is extremely intense. It becomes hyper encoded because of the flooding of norepinephrine. That memory is then continuously activated and brought to consciousness in the form of nightmares, in the form of dissociative flashbacks, in the form of intrusive conscious waking memories. We talked about all these symptoms. Every time that trauma memory is reactivated and then put back into the memory system, it is not encoded the same way as before. Instead, that trauma memory is what we call strongly reconsolidated. What that means is every time that fear memory, that trauma memory is reactivated, when it gets stored in the memory system again, it gets stored even more strongly because every time it's reactivated, there's more norepinephrine being released. And norepinephrine has been found to be a critical component of the storage of memories. So every time that trauma memory gets reactivated by the symptoms of PTSD, the flashbacks, the nightmares, the intrusive waking memories, it gets reconsolidated more strongly because of norepinephrine being released. And then when it goes back into the memory system, it's an even more graphic, more detailed, more powerful, more intense memory than the time before. These strongly encoded fear memories are undergoing frequent reactivation. So it can get what's called overly consolidated. What this means then is extinguishing or desensitizing that memory is going to be extremely difficult. The usual extinction, right, of a conditioned fear learning response that we talked about in previous classes doesn't happen. Exposure therapy works for some people, but not for others, and even less so for people with chronic PTSD, because the more strongly that memory gets reconsolidated, every single time it's brought back to consciousness and more norepinephrine is released to make it even more strongly consolidated. It becomes that much more powerful and intense. So if the biology, if the neurobiology here makes sense, then the idea is, well, is there a way to disrupt the reconsolidation process? Because if we could disrupt the reconsolidation process, we could treat PTSD symptoms. That's where propranolol comes in. What if we could target the fear part of the memory, the emotional part of the memory that's creating all of the symptoms, the pathology, while leaving the declarative component of the trauma memory intact, which is the content? that would be ideal for clinical intervention, or so some people think. So think about this. When you store a memory, you don't store only the facts of the memory. You store the emotions you experienced along with it, right? So you think about something happy like a marriage. You remember all the events, what, you know, what happened, what was said at the ceremony, and who came, and all that kind of stuff. But you also have intimately tied to those facts of the event the emotions you felt. The idea here is that emotions and declarative components of memory are stored in different places in the brain. If we could target the emotional part and dampen the fear piece and only keep the factual part, we could treat people with PTSD. Well, the question now is, let's go to slide 15. Is this a good idea? Is this a good idea? If you could treat 
with pills. PTSD symptoms by disrupting the reconsolidation process so that every time the memory is reactivated, people store the content, the facts of what happened in the trauma without intensifying the emotional memory for the trauma, the fear, the terror, the helplessness. Is this a good idea? Is it more helpful or harmful? Is it more helpful or harmful to retain facts related to our experience without the accompanying emotions involved in that experience? And I really want you guys to think about this before our next lecture, because I'm going to pick up that next lecture with propranolol again and how it impacts this process. The way to think about this before we close for today is, is there something valuable about remembering the emotional component of an experience, even if those emotions are negative or uncomfortable? And what are some of the potential drawbacks to remembering the facts or com the content of a memory without the associated emotions that went along with the experience? Think about that deeply.